Hello, um, I'm Paul Ong from Singapore. I'm really excited to be involved in discussing the Master Tech trial with Professor Fasila Malik and Dr. Aston Lee, um, two of the most respected interventionists in our region. I hope we can address some of the most important messages uh, from this pivotal trial. As you know, the Master Tech result was announced you know, only last month at the ESC late breaking session. I'm really proud that my center was able to contribute some patients to this study. But first of all, let's just have a look at the trial design. Okay, it's a large trial. It was carried out across four continents involving 30 countries, 140 sites. Um, you know, really uh, wide, well represented in the patients that we are looking after. Now, the trial design is after identifying the high bleeding risk patients, um, they are treated with angioplasty. All of the patients receive Ultimaster stent. And after one month of standard DAPT, um, the patient are then randomized into either the abbreviated DAPT arm, where one of the antiplater will be stopped, or the standard routine, uh, regime arm, where they will continue on for another five to 11 months of uh, dual antiplatelets. A little bit uh, on the uh, Ultimaster stent. So in this particular study, all patients receive the same stent in both arms. So this is one of the uh, more up-to-date uh, contemporary stents, uh, copper chromium, thin struts, 80 microns. Uh, Sarolimus was used and they have a special polymer coating. Uh, it's a gradient coating. So where the joints, uh, there are no uh, coating, so there's less risk of uh, coating fracture. And therefore this ensure that the drug distribution is evenly released over the three to five months period. As I mentioned, this is perhaps the largest uh, HBR trial to date. A total of 4,579 patients eventually get randomized to two arms. And the follow-up was fantastic, 99% per protocol. And this is particularly uh, you know, important you know, and unusual uh, because you know, this is a time of COVID and able to achieve that you know, really, really uh, thankful for the, all the trial centers and coordinators uh, to catch up uh, with all these patients. So having seen the trial design, maybe I will ask Fasila, you know, having seen the DAPT results, what does the trial mean to you and your patients? Well, uh, the trial is actually, I mean, it, I think it's going to change the way we treat our high bleeding risk patients. Well, and uh, let's have a look at the baseline characteristics and clinical presentations of these patients and so that we can have a feel of what happened here. So the patients who were in this trial, these were truly high bleeding risk patients and the vast majority of these patients were above the age of 75. A third of these patients were diabetic, 33% had atrial fibrillation, 35% were oral anticoagulants. And regarding the clinical presentation, 50% came with chronic stable angina, and the other 50% had acute coronary syndrome. And in this trial, they even included ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, so, and if we look at the procedural characteristics, we see that in 25% of the patients, there was multi-vessel intervention. And of these 65% of these patients, one at least one vessel was deemed as a high complex lesion. And if you look at the number of stents used per patient, it was 1.5. Total length of stent average was 38 millimeters and overlapping stents was done in 21 person patients. And the study showed that in this complex group of high bleeding risk patients, abbreviated DAPT regimen significantly reduced the bleeding risk without compromising the safety of these patients or increasing their ischemic risk. I think this is truly phenomenal. Thank you, Fasila, you know, for bringing up that, you know, these are really difficult patients uh, with multiple comorbidities and also quite complex angioplasty being carried out. You mentioned a little bit about the trial results. Perhaps at this point, can I invite Esti to, uh, to share with us and have a look at the master DAPT uh, outcome? Absolutely, Paul. As you can see from this slide, 
non-inferiority was shown for the primary endpoint of NACE. That's net adverse clinical events, which is a composite of all cause mortality, MI, stroke, and major bleed. In this case, BARP3 and 5 bleeding. Now, just as a reminder, BARP3 is defined as any overt bleeding, a significant drop in hemoglobin, and intracranial hemorrhage, whereas BARP5 is defined as probable or definite fatal bleed. This next slide shows that non-inferiority was also proven for MACE, major adverse cardiac and cerebral events. And the third slide, in fact, shows superiority when you add clinically relevant bleed or BARP2 bleeding to the bleeding endpoints. Now, that's any clinical sign of bleed that's actionable. That is, if you need to investigate or manage the bleeding in any way. Now, these are amazing results for our HBR patients. We are finally able to confidently shorten their depth of duration without compromising their ischemic risks, and in fact, reduce their bleeding risks. Wow, that's really important. So, Aston, how do you think the daily DAPT practice will change as a result of this trial? Thanks for the question, Paul. I actually see this trial as practice changing. Rather than think about a patient's bleeding risk after we have performed their PCI, we should really be assessing their bleeding risks even before they get on the table. If deemed to be at high bleeding risk and they require a PCI, we are then obliged to use an Ultima assistant and treat them with the abbreviated DEPT strategy that has been shown in this trial to be clearly non-inferior in terms of ischemic risks and outcomes, and superior in reducing the risks of actionable bleeds in our patients. As a true all-comers high bleeding risk trial with a specific stent and depth strategy, this trial has shown that we can reduce the bleeding risks in our patients, but not compromise the ischemic risk. Until this trial uh, was published, this has not actually been clearly demonstrated. Thank you, Aston. Um, Facilla, do you think the master depth result will impact the guidelines? Well, actually, Paul, I think the master DAP trial will definitely impact the guidelines because this trial has clearly shown that in high bleeding risk patients uh, who had undergone PCI with the implantation of a biodegradable polymer serumulimus eluding stent, the Ultimaster, uh, the discontinuation of DAP at a median of 34 days was associated with significantly lower bleeding risk without any increase in ischemic complications. So this, this really will impact our practice and the guidelines. Therefore, in the newer guidelines, I expect uh, to see a shorter DAPG regimen being recommended for high bleeding risk patients who have been implanted and treated with this stent. Thank you, Facilla. Well, my last question to both of you. Do you think master debt will apply to only the study stent? Sure, Paul. That, now, this wasn't a trial of different bioabsorbable polymer serolimus eluding stents. This trial essentially asked the question, if you have an HBR patient and you implant an Ultimaster stent, then shorten their depth duration, what would happen to their ischemic and bleeding risks? Thankfully, the trial showed reduced bleeding risks with no increased ischemic risks with this strategy. So I don't think this trial can be extrapolated to other bioabsorbable polymer serolimus eluding stents, unfortunately. What do you think, Facilla? Well, you know, the Ultimaster stent was chosen for the master DAP trial because it already had a C mark for one month uh, DAPT. And obviously not all biodegradable serolimus eluding stents are the same. Therefore, it would be naive, I think, to extrapolate the results of master DAPG to all other, other stents, all other serolimus eluding stents. Yeah, I fully agree with both of you. Um, so perhaps at this point, I just want to uh, wrap the sessions up and come up with some take home messages. Now, I believe that Ultimaster stand has demonstrated excellent safety and efficacy data in the HBR subjects. Uh, some would argue they are amongst the most challenging group of patients. MasterTap is not only the single largest trial to look at PCI in high bleeding risk patients. It went on to compare, number one, 
the one month DAPD strategy against the most contemporary practice of six to 12 months DAPT. And he convincingly demonstrated that, first of all, when ulti master stand was implanted, one month DAPD is non-inferior to six to 12 months of DAPD in ischemic outcomes. But equally important, a superior safety endpoint in terms of actionable bleeding complications. Unlike the other HPR-PCI trials, this is the first time the precise step score was integrated in the inclusion criteria. While this may not be universally adopted by all interventionists, our speakers, Professor and Aston, will strongly encourage a careful pre-PCI bleeding risk assessment for each and every patient. So at this point, can I just check, Vasila, is there any other ethical message you would like to share with us? I think that was a great discussion. And I'm really happy that now we have an answer for our high bleeding risk patients. And we can safely treat them and give a shorter DAPT without compromising or increasing any of their risks. Great results. Thank you. And Astin, any final comments before we close the session? Thank you, Paul. I I've thought that this was a fantastic summary of this uh, landmark trial, and it gives us guidance now on what we do with our high bleeding risk patients that require PCR in terms of their DEP strategy. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank my co-moderators and close the session. I hope you will enjoy the rest of Asia PCR 2021. Thank you.